Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Literary Hour on Focus on Liberia. I'm your co-host, Jackie Sai. My colleague and co-host, Dennis Ja, is unable to join us at this time. Today, we are honored to have one of our own, an accomplished Liberian, Ms. Cotto Reeves, whose work spans several areas of empowerment and development. Cotto Reeves is an African feminist who frames her contribution to scholarship and movement building using the checkpoint as a symbol of patriarchal fundamentalist systems that violates people's rights. A survivor of the Liberian 14 year civil war, Koto has used writing as a path of healing and a call for justice. Her other writings include contribution to a soon to be released women's writing project, Right to Speak, Finding a Feminist, um, Finding a Feminist Feminist Africa, Navigating Checkpoints, The Journey of the Liberia Feminist Forum and African Women Development Fund, Voice, Power, and Soul Portraits of African Feminists. Her works have been featured in the Liberian Sea Breach Online, Open Democracy, Al Jazeera, Huffington Post, and local dailies in Liberia. Adding to her impressive resume, Ms. Reeves is one of the founders of the Liberia Feminist Forum. Koto, welcome to the Liberian Literary Hour on Focus on Liberia. It is a pleasure to have you join us today and congratulations on the publication of your book, Inappropriate Melody, Medley. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I am so happy to be here today. Um, in fact, I think this is my first uh, this is my second interview since I uh, published the book. So it's good to be, you know, with my Liberian family. But I also know that this space is a global space. So it's really good to be able to talk about the book. Um, yeah, tonight. Okay, so we'll just get right in because we know that you are uh, preparing for your launch tomorrow and we will talk about the launch later. So... Um, Ernest Hemingway once said about writing that there is nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Do you agree? Well, it is um, interesting that that is, is aligned to my experience writing this book. Um, I didn't sit at a typewriter, but it was definitely... Um, a process of, um, you know, putting things on paper that were very important, you know, as our blood um, tears. So that was, you know, a similar process. So while I may not agree with uh, Hemingway um, in everything, uh, it, it is aligned to what I did because the whole idea of, doing this book, uh, like I said in another interview, that this wasn't really a plan to do a book of poetry. I had no plan to do a book of poetry. I like to write, you know, I have a background in English literature and language, uh, English language and literature. So that, you know, sort of pushed me into that area where I believe that um, creativity, um, Innovative writing was not just uh, for our classroom. It was also for uh, political analysis. Um, it was about contextual analysis, symbolism, which is a topic that I am interested in. So when I had the experience of like almost all Liberians, you know, between um, 1989 um, and 2003, when I had that experience um, and did not have access to professional counseling or had access to, you know, a means that I would be able to support myself, um, especially around my mental health. Uh, the first place I went to be able to deal with uh, the issues that I had at the time was writing because writing was a safe space for me. And that was something that I knew I could do well. So I literally, you know, as Hemingway says, I bled on paper, I wrote, you know, everything and I, you know, it, in a way it was like, if I can see this on paper, if I can talk it, then, you know, it, it, it is real, but I'm also getting it out of my, myself, my body, my person. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, bleeding, yeah, writing the ink, metaphorically yeah. or symbolically, the ink is actually blood, you know, you yeah. bleed paper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, a lot, yes. Yeah, it's, you, you describe inappropriate medley as a story of loss and redemption. How did you come about to choose such a paradoxically intriguing title, Inappropriate Medley? Yeah, um, the content, the content of the book, um, if you are not um, someone who understands uh, feminist uh, politics, if you're not an activist, if you have not gone through the raw experience of negotiating for your life and realizing, you know, um, a decade after that you are alive, it is difficult, you know, to, I would say, understand why I have it. It's because of the content and the way that it seems uh, mixed to the ordinary eye is why I say that if you look at this medley, you're going to say, well, it's not appropriate. I don't think these things match. I don't think they're supposed to be together. And I actually thought about this uh, title like maybe 10 years ago, 10 years ago. So I have a, you know, a book cover that I was designing myself and it was called, you know, inappropriate medley. And it was for a book. It wasn't for, you know, like a book of poetry. It was for a book of prose. So, yes, so that's why I thought about it. And I, what I've done to the book is, in terms of the structure, um, it's divided into different parts, different sections. So there is a section that talks about uh, the war, um, experiences at the checkpoint, um, Liberia, in terms of, you know, looking forward and looking up, you know, lifting the country and understanding that, uh, this is, uh, I guess, one of the most uh, precious things that we have as a people. Uh, so I talk about that, but I put it within the frame of the hurdles and the, you know, challenges that we have as a country. And the sort of um, overarching frame is the checkpoint. And there's a lot in there about the war. So that's the first part. Um, the second part of the book looks at, um, how do you call it? It looks at myths about beauty and ageism, um, you know, all of the things that we experience as Liberian women. Um, so that's the second part of it. Um, the third part uh, looks at, um, how do you call it? Um, what is it? The Liberian realities. That's how I call it. Um, the Liberian realities where I am um, speaking about what is happening in current day Liberia. So that part is a bit... Um, Interesting in terms of because you'll see issues in there, but what I've also done is I've mystified it where it's in Liberian English. So you have to go deeper. You have to be interested in understanding what is happening. You know, what is our Liberian reality? And then I move forward uh, to talk about love and redemption. And that is sort of more, um, you know, before love and redemption, I talk about um, our bodies in the state. So the state of our bodies, the state and our bodies. And again, it's like, you know, paradoxical where I'm saying it's not just the state of our bodies in terms of how we are. It's also the state as in the different institutions in our bodies. So what are the laws? What are the policies? What are the regulations? You know, what is it that we consider to be important in our society? Say, for example, marriage, um, you know, issues around identity, how are all of the, all those things uh, featured in the laws and policies and regulations that we have, and how does it affect the ordinary Liberian? So that's what the portrait in that side is about. But then when I get to the end, I think what I'm trying to connect, so it's a continuum. What I'm trying to connect is to say that in the beginning where I'm talking about the checkpoints, And what happened at the checkpoints, I'm saying that we had no control over our bodies, you know, so we had no control. But when you get to the point where um, I can now make choices, I do not have to go through physical checkpoints because there are still checkpoints. I do not have to go through physical checkpoints that I'm saying that the expression of that, I'm seeing it as freedom, as equality. So that is the continuum. That's how I've been able to connect all of those things. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's also, it's also about a positive message that we've we've we are resilient. So we've gone through what were the checkpoints in the beginning, and we've reached a point where it's it's no longer about it's about us being able to stand and say this is what we consider to be freedom, and that freedom cannot be questioned by you know the laws, the you know different authorities as patriarchal as they are. We can fight them. So that's that's the point. That, yeah, that I, as I as I read it, as I I read it, um, actually it was very interesting because I I made I made note and I said. Huh. The 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 um the first first uh, 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 section I read, but the second is more personal. You know, mm-hmm. it. I mean, I I I didn't experience the the, the war, but mm-hmm. section two for me was more personal. You know, miss on beauty, ageism, transition. Mm-hmm. You know, and then section three was personal, but not so much as section two. There was a subtle shift. From the from the second session, but a great shift from the first. Like you say, it's a continuum, you know. And the changes I explain. I mean, I'm not. I'm. I know you're gonna save everything for the launch, but like I am different, you know. When you read that, you're like, hmm, you know. So it's 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 truly a wonderful collection of of thank of you the book. Thank you. Know, you. Like I would, you know, yeah, it, it's available on Kindle uh, librarians and everybody. So please get a copy. It's it's really you know I was. When I read, and one of them, one of the poems in there that I really like, and I don't know if I, is, uh, uh, we are not made up of beauty. Beauty is not made up, as, uh, or I think that's the title. The, the beautiful ones are made are up. Are not made up. The beautiful ones are not made up, you know, and I'm reading it. I'm going like, wow, you know, every poem that I'm reading in section two and section three, you know, it's speaking to me. So Thank I you. think that, you know, you're, you're really gifted writer and i really enjoy enjoy the book yeah so so um uh dennis and i were were taught were exploring earlier on a broadcast about the various phases of the liberian literary canon you know tracing the country's evolutionary development and aligning it with various historical stages of growth and development in liberia so in section one of your book i was like hmm this this it, it talks about the pain you know but I would say it's 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 coming to almost protest, but no, it's protest, and then it's exile and remembrance. I'm trying to put it in this this phase, you know. But like you say, it overlaps. You know, you cannot try and pigeonhole it, and then and then um, uh, in exile and remembrance, you know, the poem, the woman on Carey Street, you know. And people, I'm yeah. t- I'm saying this because I really enjoy the poem. So please go, you know, because. Mm-hmm. I think, I think trauma trauma creates a bond, you know? Mm-hmm. And when she goes and then she finds somebody who has gone through the trauma with her, you know, she 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 remember she she finds the guy, of course you remember it's your book, you know. And I'm like, yeah, it's a bond. <laughs> it creates a bond that no matter if you're gone 14 years or 20 years, you know, you come back, remember, she remembers, and then when she finds this person, she remembers uh, uh, um with this person that is sheltered together. So I, 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 I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed the woman on Kerry Street. Thank you, so. Jackie. And I, I want to say something. I, I actually, you know, wanted to say this to you long ago. I had a conversation with you um, one night yes. at one point in time when, you know, we're all concerned about um, the coronavirus and we really seemed lost. Well, I was on Facebook like maybe two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, and we started to talk. And you told me that you know you you write also, and your work was about to be published, you know, in a in a magazine. Yeah. And you shared it with me, and it seemed so you know familiar in terms of the theme and the, the way you express yourself. And I'm like, I've never talked to Jackie about you know poems before. So this sort of, the, the fact that it's resonating across continents, you know, with Liberian women, we have so much in common. I think that was when I told you, I have something that I can also share with you. So yeah. what I had was not just one poem. I had like 25 poems that I had done. I had started writing since 2005. 
when I left Liberia the first time after the war, you know, like actually moving out, I had gone to a uh, grad school. And in the middle of, you know, uh, uh, a strange place, I think I recognized my mental health issues. And it wasn't like, you know, I, I was, I had, you know, like depression and my responses were not really normal, you know, and I was in a strange place. So I wrote more, you know, I started to write more, write more, but also, you know, connect to people and learn, you know, what exactly was happening. Like I almost had to relearn a lot of social skills because as far as I was concerned, I was always getting to a checkpoint and I had to negotiate and I had to fight for myself. So when I, you know, look at the, the poems, I'm like, oh, maybe I could think about, you know, publishing them because I'm writing a book and I'm sort of insecure about putting that book out. So maybe the, the poem becomes, you know, my introduction to the world that I write and I'm writing, you know, along these lines. So it's based on that, that I was inspired to do the book. So thank you. I, I really feel, yeah, I really feel uh, gratified uh, with your response because you don't even know that, you know, you were the one who sort of encouraged me indirectly when you said, no, I'm publishing. And, you know, you talk about, I think it was your grandmother that you were yes. writing about with you yes. in your life. my favorite topic. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And that's really important to me, you know, the sort of memory of our women ancestors, you know, the, the roles that they played in our lives and how all of that becomes erased, you know, um, under patriarchal regimes. Yes. You know, on a daily basis. So I, that is also important to me. So I just want to say this, you know, publicly. Uh, thank you very much for encouraging me. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so, um, so like the like like when we were um, when I was reading the book, you know, I read it with my daughter. We kept going back and forth because she's also a writer. Um, like the woman in Baltimore with the bonsoir bon hairstyle. Yeah. <laughs> Reclaiming their bodies and their stories. But you, you write that this book sends a feminist political message that we must ex excavate how sexual violence and murder at checkpoints distorted our understanding of pleasure and reinforced the narrative mm -hmm. our right to control our bodies is non-existent. And I, 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 I will not introduce you as um, a feminist writer. I would say a writer who happens to be feminist. So how can we begin to, begin to reclaim this agency uh, from intimacy after such a distortion? Uh, do they write? What do they do? And now I'm asking in your, in your sphere as a feminist, what would, what a, a woman in Liberia who has gone through these checkpoints and this distortion of her sexual sex, sexuality, how can she reclaim, if she is not a writer, what would you encourage her to do? to reclaim this agency that she lost? Yeah. So I think this is the difficult part um, as a writer, um, as a feminist, and I think that is um, intersecting. I don't think uh, they are divided. There's no dichotomy here. Okay. Um, I, I think the difficult part is to be able to um, ensure that this message that I have in the poetry, that it is going to start a conversation so that we talk about the things that we consider to be taboo. For example, the socialization, the forced socialization that many Liberian women, young women had just by going through the checkpoints. And I always yes. tell the story of Going through the checkpoints, I remember, you know, for Liberians on the call, I remember um, we came through, we came from Dry Rice Market and went to, you know, through Johnsonville, and then we got to Fendel, not Fendel, we got to Mount Barclay first. And when we finally were able to go through all of those checkpoints, you know, Dry Rice Market or wherever, when we turned, one of the first things that I saw um, was a group of teenage boys sitting at a checkpoint and they had um, magazines, pornographic magazines. 
And growing up, I know that this was something that was a no-no in many homes. You know, there wasn't any conversation. And that's the Liberian society, you know, the way we we sort of, um, we're superficial around our, you know, the issues of morality. So you can't do this. And although there's someone doing it, you know, even though, you, you know, it's like you don't know, but someone is doing it. And when I saw that in daylight, in an open space, and they were calling women, you know, as old as their mothers and saying, come and sit, let's look at the magazine together. I imagined a young girl who had no idea of what sexuality was, you know, um, what would be her response and what is her context today, you know? So I feel like even if we don't have answers, this book is really about picking up the, the conversations we've never had because in the end, we can link that to our current context. You know, when we talk about rape, uh, sexual and other uh, forms of gender-based violence in a Liberian society, like how do we divorce that from what happened as we went through the checkpoints? That desensitization of the Liberian society. But I also go back and say, this isn't just, you know, about 1990 and the war and the checkpoints. It's about a society that had been desensitized before. So what exactly do we, what kind of analysis do we need to, to make? What kind of stories we need to tell? And I'm, I'm sure, you know, not everyone is going to be a feminist writer and write about the things that I, I've written about. But I see this as a project, you know, starting the conversation and hopefully, you know, even around, say, for example, the, the simple things. And I will say simple things, even though they may not be so simple. You know, where the, the myth, uh, one of the things I talk about in my poem is the whole issue of menopause. I talk about menopause because I realize that we are valued along, along the lines of, it's almost like a um, benchmark. It's, it's like a continuum also, you know. So which woman is more valuable in the Liberian society? Is it the woman who is between the ages of, say, five and 20, you know, what is that linked to? Is that linked to fertility? Is that linked to beauty as defined in patriarchal context? You know, by the time you get to 25 in a Liberian society, you hear people tell you, ah, you get, you owe now. <laughs> you, get married. you understand my point, right? This is yes, yes. You get to 35 and 40. No, we're not talking about those people. They are old women. So in my work, I also have a day job. I've had the experience of a 16-year-old girl, girl saying to me, you know, directly that, mm, I'm not interested in that because I'm old now. She was 16. And I'm sure I was like 40-something. And I'm like, where, where in, you know, where did we feel that a 16-year-old a girl can call herself old? Yeah. So the point I'm making is that when we can turn all of these things on their heads by just starting to talk about them, by just starting to ask questions, I think it's going to add some value to the work that we do around advocacy because the work, work we do around advocacy is not really about what we see in our faces. There are root causes, there are structural causes. And if we cannot address those things, this is where we have a problem. So this is why you have the government of Liberia, and I'm not just talking about this government, but the government, you know, past government, they would have a whole campaign on child rape and sort of silence the, the issues and the, the concerns, you know, and the violence that comes to women who are sexually active. So the women who are sexually active are not going to report rape because they know that there's nothing in the system, there's no recognition for this violation of their bodies and their minds. It's because of that continuum. So let's, I think my project, my feminist project is let's start to talk about it. And there are many other people who have talked about it, you know, like this is not the first time, but this is just my framing, you know, and I feel like I'm not going to just write a book of poetry and say, yes, buy it, it's nice, you know, and read it. This is something that I'm going to invest a lot into, especially in terms of conversations and actions and courses. What can we do now that you have read about the woman in Baltimore? What do we want to do about it? Because when I saw that woman in Baltimore, I actually saw her. 
on the streets. And I, the first thing that was, you know, interesting to me was that she had Bonsoir. I'm like, oh, they took Bonsoir here too. You know, but then there's the whole African-American link. But I felt like, you know, how can a body be robbed of energy, of, you know, resilience, of youthfulness? And she's walking in the streets, you know, and there is no one who is accountable for what she has been reduced to. There is no one accountable for that. And yes, we'll say, okay, I'm not in Baltimore. I'm not like that woman. I'm not walking in the street. But what happens to women in Liberia? Who's accountable? Who's accountable? You know, whether you are president, you are minister, you whatever, or you are the man in the house from the public to the private spaces, who's really accountable to say our society is like this because of what we have done or what we have not done because of the gaps? Who's going to do that? So this is what my poetry is, is about. It's, it's radical, you know, and, you know, I know that it's, it's a message that I had to, you know, like when people say, what is it, Basso people say message, that like Kinja, that you get to put down, right? We also say Bati or Bati. There's something that I have to say. So I did that. Because I feel like it's important at this point in time in the Liberian society. And there are many other, you know, nuggets and, and different kinds of framing that I've done that we could do this for the next, you know, five years in terms of actually um, talking and, and trying to bring some structure to our talents, but also to be able to fix our society in a way that is not um, one way. And when I say one way, it's not just about, you know, we can go on Facebook and we can talk, you know, about what we should be in a vacuum. I think it's it's time that we start to think about everyone. So it's not just, you know, people who are economists, people who work with NGOs, you know, all of these different professions, you know, even the creatives. I believe that people who are creative artists are the ones who will save the society because you're doing this. I'm not looking for anything, you know, even not even. You know, nothing. I'm just doing this because I need to free myself and, and put this on paper and put it out there in public space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I, uh, while you were speaking, I got reminded of um, the saying that uh, courage, courage uh, and, and change. Change is made in the courage cracks of the everyday. You know, mm. you talk about the tarmac and the checkpoints and the in-between. You know, it's the ordinary people that's going to save Liberia, honestly. You know, mm -hmm. I mentioned to my daughter one time that it's like when, whenever I, I, I go home, it's almost like another world. You know, it's they, they pigeonhole women. Either you're a married woman or you're a single woman or you are the other, you know. And that other, that explanation of the other comes in so many different guises, you know, like I would go restaurant to eat alone and they, and they will say, uh, 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 and I would just want to sit, you know, by the beach and they will say, are you waiting for somebody? I'm like, yeah. but can you pay before you eat? I'm like, well, I have the money, you know, and, and all of those things kind of remind you that we, we, we have such a long way to go, you know, back, back, um, back home, but in, in other parts of the world as well, you know, women are, are pigeonholed. And if you don't fit in that mold, you are the other, and the other need, need to be uh, marginalized, identified as you know something lesser, which is which is very sad for 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 women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so um, if we we come back to the to the book about um I, I, when I when I read your book, it's such an empowering book. You know, I I I, I always get these little snippets of quotes, and I I remember. The one by Chinua Achebe that says, until lions have their historians, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And I said, oh, so this lion is writing, <laughs> you know, she, she, she's writing, you know, you've given us cleansing and reclaiming, as you say, through storytelling. We need more lions, right? Your teacher told you to write an original poem and you, you, you said, okay, you took that on and you went. So, so. Yeah. If there are budding lions, emerging lions coming up, you know, people who want to write their stories but don't know how, what advice would you give them? 
Um, I think, yeah, I think it's important to to write. Yes. It's important to start to write. Um, there, there will be support. You know, there are many people who are interested in doing this kind of work. I know um, Dr. Wesley has a program, you know, a, a significant program that she's doing with young people in Liberia, you know, supporting them. I believe that it's important to write. And I, I've done this, you know, like, Growing up, I was exposed to to writing and to reading. And I remember getting a new book every day. Every day. They used to sell, and I'm giving away my age, but they used to sell um, bear time stories under the Ministry of Education. I think it used to be like 20 cents or less than that. And my mom used to buy a new book every day. And it was very, you know, absolutely interesting. Like I had no idea. Let me tell you one of the things that was so interesting to me. The whole idea of the kangaroo keeping its child in a pouch. I knew nothing. I did not know what was Australia, you know, where Australia was. But I knew that this was amazing, you know, like, hmm. So the baby is not on his back, it's in the pouch. Is it painful, but they seem comfortable, you know? And I was all but maybe five years old. And that is how my mind sort of opened. And I'm saying this from a place of privilege because I know that not many young people would be in that position where they would get a new book every day, especially in today's Liberia. Um, or they may not be in school or have, you know, some sort of guidance or parents who will say, write. My children, I've told them to write every day, literally, you know, like you come from school, take that notebook and write. And they'll be like, but I don't have anything to write. I'm like, just make up a story, write, you know, so that they would be able to get interested in expressing themselves in themselves in written form. So I think um, it is a... Uh, uh, the reality that we may not have like a reading society. And I think it is a burden on us who know the value, especially if, you know, those of us who grew up, you know, before the war and under, you know, to have an appreciation of a different Liberia when it comes to, you know, literacy uh, skills or, you know, books and the love of books, you know, the content of books, you know, how you could travel to many different countries without even leaving your bed. So I think it is the onus is on us to um, present that as an offer to the Liberian society, to the young people and say, this is something that you could do. You know, the time that you take to run, you know, run around and get a visa to go to another country and you do it for five, 10 years and you never, you never successful, you know, you could actually build your skills during this time. And I'm saying that again, recognizing the issues around economic justice in Liberia, that people don't have access to public services and they are looking for a better life. But I'm just saying that the onus is on us. So if we can recognize that it's not just people who are in school who can tell stories, I think that's also really important to me, that it's not just people who are in schools who can tell stories, people who are formally educated that can tell stories. I think we will get the value of what is it that we are resting on as Liberians? What are the stories that we know? You know, when I think about forgetting all of these stories, you know, about spider that we used to hear, there's almost, when I think about a story like long ago, there's a particular, you know, I, I smell, the, it's almost like I go back so many years and I'm like, what did spider do? What did they cook? You know, what was he doing? You know, and I, I feel all of that, that nostalgia, I feel it. And I feel like it's such a beautiful thing, especially around learning and being able to express yourself. Because when you can do that, you can challenge many other things, you know, in life. So the onus is on us. You know, I'm writing a book now. I feel like I am going to write another book. You know, I hope I'll be able to do another book in a year's time. I'm about 30%, you know, into that project. But I also feel like I must do something as someone who did not have 
Yes, I had some privilege, but did not have the privilege and did not expect to be at this point in my life today to help other people to be able to do this, you know, not just my immediate family. And I think that's what I'm investing um, in at the moment, you know, to start to have these conversations, ask people to, to write their stories, to tell their stories, document it. It can be video, it can be, you know, audio. You don't have to know all of the words that I put in my book of poetry, you know, to, to say something that you want to say, something that is important, you know, in terms of change making in Liberia. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Well, before we 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 talk about your your um the launch tomorrow, um, ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Focus on Liberia. It's the literary hour with Dennis and Aki. Dennis is not here today, and we are speaking with Miss Cotto Reeves about her book and her work. Her book is Inappropriate Medley. So please pick up your copy so you can join the launch tomorrow. Okay, so the last, the last section of the book, Passion and Redemption, right, is what we refer to uh, as the phase of return and belonging. So mm -hmm. that returning brings with it its own associated problems and complexities. Returning is not always returning. So closure at times, as you say, is never closure. It is only a personal path of negotiation, negotiation and compromise, right? So why do you think redemption? Because you, you talk about that in, your, in some of your writings. Why do you think it's necessary? And how did you come about finding it if indeed you have found it? So I, I believe that, um, Jackie, that the gory nature of the war, that deep suffering that we went through as Liberians, you know, going through the checkpoints, losing our family members, the different, you know, massacres, murder. And, you know, as I wrote the book and as I, you know, been really active in the last, you know, month, um, dealing with all of the issues associated with the book, one of the things that I realized was that from December 24th, 1989, for the next 10 years plus, I believe that almost every day that families were losing someone. So you can, if you decided that you tell families, one, one family, uh, one individual stand up every day and say, yes, John Brown, my brother was killed on January 1st. January 2nd, who was the next person? January 3rd, because while all of this seems to be like statistics in reports, you know, international organizations reports, this is very, um, you know, special, not, and not special in a way that is good, but it's a very um, direct pain and loss that families felt. These people were connected to other people and those people remained after they left. So, if you went through the war, and I'll put the emphasis on women, and not because, you know, men did not suffer during the war, but if you went through the war, you went through the checkpoints, and you're my age, the war was what, 30 years ago, 31 years ago, and you can get up in the morning and have the choice, you know, coronavirus um, pandemic aside, and have the choice to say, I'm going to wear a blue dress. Uh, maybe it's time for me to cut my hair. All of the choices I can make. Maybe I don't want to, you know, I'll go to the gym and maybe I'll do a massage. When you can do all of these things, knowing that you were given a second chance, just the mere, the mere action of having that opportunity and having that independence it's a thing of pleasure. It's a thing of pleasure. So the book is about, you know, some, you know, personal things, some of them not personal, but it is a thing of pleasure that I am free. This is redemption. I'm even free to be able to stand up to the violation of people's rights. Who could do that at the checkpoints? Who could do it? You know, I, I have another story that I explained that when I got to, and I'm explaining these stories not because it's specific to me. You know, there were 
250,000 people who died um, and so many more people who suffered, you know, and went through similar instances. So I'm giving my experience only because, you know, I'm speaking at this time. But I went through the checkpoints and we got to Fendel at the gate. Not Fendel itself, the, the road before you go into where you turn. And when we got there, um, there was this woman who said, oh, hello, what's your name? I'm not sure whether she said, hello, you know, um, what is your name? And I said, Koto. And you know, Liberia, that we are sometimes really clear about where people come from because of their needs, their background. So she was like, oh, you, Pele woman. And she started to speak Pele to me, you know, hello. I said, hello back in Pele, you know, what is your name? I answered, where are you coming from? I answered, and I don't know Pele, you know, to the point where I can start to talk about, you know, when, when did you last see your grandmother? You know, I don't know Pele that well. And yes, so when I reached that point, she was like, oh, so you were the ones who were sitting in Morovia and did not learn to speak your language. I'm going to kill you. And I had seen people, you know, being killed on the, the, the way coming. And I did not believe that I would fall into that, you know, category. But I was scared. She put me on the side, you know, after a few minutes, I'm like, okay, maybe she's going to change her mind. She did not change her mind. And I was standing there waiting for her to decide, you know, which way she was going to kill me. And there was this, you know, soldier, young man who came from in the house, you know, down the hallway, I still remember. And it must have been like a greenhouse. Anybody listening, I'm sure you know the checkpoint. I'm making, I may be making a mistake, you know, with the color. But he came down the hallway and he walked to me and he kissed me in my mouth. And said, don't, don't, you know, don't kill her. Um, she's beautiful. She can be somebody's wife. So let her go. And this woman looked at me on the basis of what this young man had said after he, he kissed me. She said, you can go. But of course, I had died many times, you know, just standing there and like, you know, what's going to happen. But I explained this story to say that the level of um, disconnect I felt when this man kissed me. You know, I, I did not feel violated. Like, why did he touch me? Why did, because I wasn't even feeling, you know, I was numb to everything around me, to my environment. And if I can make a choice today and get up in the morning and say, this is the person I'm going to kiss. This is the person I don't want to kiss. You understand? For me, it is redemption yes. because, you know, a decade ago, a lot more could have happened to me. I could have lost my life. So many people lost their lives. So this is why I say it's redemption. And the whole idea of having eroticism and, you know, pleasure, uh, framing that particular part of the book is because this is also taboo in our Liberian society. People don't want to talk about this. You know, it's almost like um, there are many, you know, the babies come from somewhere, maybe, you know, under the bed and that's it. You know, people don't want to talk about it. So again, for me, it is about breaking that tradition and challenging the status quo to write what I want to write about. It is redemption. And I believe that people will have the choice. So when I talk about a book, you know, from the context of checkpoints, I see a lot of people are so excited. I want to read about the war. I want to read about the war. <laughs> and my sons, you know, they always say my children, they'll be like, well, you, you will read the whole book and I hope you like the book in the end. And this is very political for me to be able to say these things and put them in public, you know, in public space. It's, it's important for me. Yeah, by by the time you read the end of the book, it's like the minute you open, it takes you on a voyage, you know, a voyage of discovery, a voyage of pain, a voyage of just sometimes you just wonder, you know, but then at the end of the book, that last inappropriate medley, by the time yeah. you get there, you know, it's like it's like a catharsis. You've gone yeah. through all of these yeah. emotions and at the end, you almost exhale. 
you know, at the end. I mean, at least that's how I felt. The first section, I read it because I wanted to understand. But as I started to read section two, section three, by the time I got to the end, I was like, oh, I'm I'm free. Are you going to read the entire book tonight? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just don't talk. Don't talk. (laughs) You know, so it's, 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 it's really, I would urge everybody to get a copy. It's really, if you cannot put your experiences into words, it will help you to put it in. You will identify yourself in that book. In, in one of those pages, you will find yourself. You know, it's, 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 it's an insightful, it's an enlightening, it's a redemptive experience, you know, you. with you and reading the book. It's, it's really, it's really and I, I hope that you will bleed many times on paper for us, you know, I will. We, need to keep re- we need to keep reading, you know, um, no typewriter, but definitely, you know, the lions have started to write and we cannot let, um, uh, we cannot let the narrative continue. The counter narrative uh, uh, and that tries to distort must be pushed aside. We must tell the stories. I always, um, uh, well, I feel like uh, we need, a shrine in Liberia for those people that died in the cracks. The unknown soldier monument is there, but we need something. We need something that is holy ground, you know, that as people go there, um, uh, you you know, it's like I went to Ghana one time, not to uh, just a, a, a brief, and when I went there, I, I went to the castle, to the slave castle. And as I was, there, you know, I mean, looking at these, these cannons and the doors that says uh, male slaves and things. I heard music, you know, somebody was playing this loud music and people were posing and yelling and saying, let's hurry up and move from here. And I walked over to the person and one of the pictures I have is me holding the Liberian flag at the castle because there was a, a group of Liberians there, you know, and they were the ones and I said, look, this is holy ground. This is not the place you come to play loud music and say, there's nothing here to see and leave. When you enter this place, this is holy ground, you know? And the, the guy looked at me, but I feel like, like in absence of this sacred place, mm-hmm. writings will be the sacred place, you know? Mm-hmm. Be the sacred places. And one of yours is definitely one. I, I, I mean, it's been, it's been, an experience talking to you. Thank you so much for this. You know, thank you for this. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the launch tomorrow? Because, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, tomorrow I am launching the book um, in Nairobi. It's going to be a virtual launch uh, because of the, you know, public health uh, context uh, globally. Um I will do it at a place. It's a restaurant, but the restaurant has a library in it. So it's called the library. And I'm going to do it um, in there. I will have, you know, my family and, um, you know, a few people. So to to sort of be COVID uh, compliant. Um, The launch is going to be um supported uh if you you know noticed in a book i was able to um get two of my colleagues to contribute to the book um evans adolfo and marvin davis so hopefully uh marvin will be able to join um to talk about his contribution and why he joined the project uh evans uh, has been doing something very exciting today in liberia you know, sad, but um, important. So he was in Bunk County and he sent me a message. He's like, you know, we are doing the launch tomorrow. Do you remember the checkpoints, you know, from Bunk County all the way to Monrovia? And I said, mm, yes, I remember some. And even so myself started to, you know, sort of name the checkpoints. You know, he was very young, so he doesn't remember a lot. Um, I could remember. So I was telling him, and it was almost like this was reliving, you know, what had happened just yes. So even took a lot of pictures, and I think we're going to show some of them tomorrow, the different kids. They don't look the same, but then it comes back to your conversation about Holy Ground, your point. So this is where, and 
my thing is, you know, thinking about, um, you know, going off tangent, but yes, I'll say it anyway. Think about all of the people who got killed at checkpoints, their bodies pushed into the bush. They did not get burial, any sort of, you know, decent burial, any burial for many people. The skeleton will still be there, right? It will still be there. And we think that we've forgotten. Like this is the road that we travel to go and do other things and we're passing through these places. So if you reflect, you know, which is what events did today in a very concrete way, if you reflect, you know, you, you see that we are living in a space where we need to answer questions and we need to act on certain things. Yes. So um, events is going to, you know, be there. I also, you know, have asked uh, several people who played a key role, you know, in just speaking about memorialization and memory, um, you know, women's rights. I've asked uh, them to join virtually. And, you know, we're going to have people speak, um, you know, in a small way, like five minutes about things. And I will also answer questions. So this is going to be the 100% um, <laughs> answering of questions. Uh, I will read, yes, I will read uh, maybe one or two of the poems. Um, and just, you know, speak a little bit about why I'm doing this. I've to, I'm talking about it now, but I think I'm going to go deeper in terms of what are the plans, you know, what next. So that's that's what is going to happen. It's not going to be, you know, a long lunch. It, it will be about maybe an hour, 30 minutes. And then I will continuously, um, you know, start conversations um, online, you know, and talk about discussions about the book. So tomorrow is going to be really... Um, exciting. I'm really proud that I did this. Um, it was a promise to myself, but also a promise to so many people that we loved, you know, who got taken away from us because of the war. It was, you know, an ode to the strength, you know, of Liberian women, of Liberian people, the resilience of Liberian people, that today we can... Um, you know, move around and I tell people, you know, you don't know what's behind the smile of a Liberian. Yes. Don't know what's behind that because we've been through a lot and we're not the only country, but we've been through a lot and it's it's important to recognize that if you live in Liberia, it's also a, an offer to the younger generation. Sometimes when you talk about the war, they say... Um, you know, oh, why can't you forget this? You know, why do you continuously talk about it? And I, I just want to be able to give um, some sort of visual perspective through my poems so that they will understand that this was not easy. It was not easy. And the people you see today in my generation that you consider to be um, strong, you know, we've, we've been through a lot. And we're not asking for pity. We're just saying that recognize that this should never happen in our country again. And how do we ensure that it does not happen in our country is for us to be able to dismantle the checkpoints, yes. to be able to stand up to the checkpoints, to be able to recognize that freedom that we must have. So whether that freedom is, is um, translated, you know, as pleasure, as, you know, the, the equalities that we seek, let's, make Liberia to, you know, be a country that reflects all of these different things in a tangible way. So that's, that's what the book is about. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, really happy that I did it. It was, it was a difficult thing to, to put it out in public because I felt like this is going to cause trouble for many people, you know, people wouldn't want to read it um, or they wouldn't think that this is what they, they want to read. So yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's let's see if there are questions that others might want to ask. Um, so uh, Rachel Johnson is saying that there should be a war museum, you know, something mm -hmm. almost like the one they have in Washington, the Holocaust Museum or the Genocide Museum in Rwanda, you know. Um, so she said that it, and... and um, and Al, Al Bamo is, is remembering, he said, there used to be bodies all over the place. He saw so many evil, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah. So then somebody mentioned about your experience when a lady pulled you outside uh, uh, in the line and she he said that that was wrong, evil doing. You see, and, and the Liberia is waking up because we did evil to one another. Um, and then they talk about speaking out, you know, um, and, and um, yeah, I, 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 I know the scars that people carry. I, I wrote a poem called Say Nothing and I was driving mm-hmm. my cousin, you know, from, from Barnesville Estate to Cottington. And we went, mm-hmm. there was this big cotton tree and I, 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 I took the picture. I was like, oh, 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 I really like this tree, you know, and I stopped the car and I got out thinking she would get out also to take my picture by the tree. And she stayed in a car. And I was like, who's going to take my picture? <laughs> you know, so I went back in a car and she said, this was a checkpoint. There was, there was a stream running on a leaf. And she said, and that stream was red with blood. She said, I can't get out of the car. And we drove almost 40 minutes. She didn't say a word. And um, one of the, the, the poems that I wrote is actually on, on I posted on Facebook. It's called Say Nothing, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's like people are living with scars, you know? But I, 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 I pray that as you find redemption and healing in writing, that they also will find redemption and healing. And as you say, you know, then you get a choice. You, you get a choice to move on. You get a choice to decide for yourself who to kiss who to have pleasure with, not that is forced on you. And I, I agree with you that Liberia is still within in the grasp of the hurt and the scars. And we need, we need healing one way or the other to move past. I always feel like sometimes we're in this waiting place, you know? I don't know what we're waiting for, but we're in this waiting place. And even if it's just an acknowledgement of, I'm sorry for what I did to you, you know? But if you live with perpetrators and they're not sorry, then, then you, your, your hurt goes on. There's no redemption because the person themselves don't feel that they've done wrong to you. So mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with, with everything uh, um, you've said. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are on Focus on Liberia. You can um, send in your questions if you want. Koto is here for a few more minutes. So if you want to, to send your questions, now's the time. If you want to ask a, about a specific poem that you read, <laughs> Uh, let us know uh, because we will be wrapping up soon. So, so um, uh, in your in your 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 in your poetry, your 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 structure of the poetry and things, are there are there poems that you left out? I mean, you said you wrote a lot of poems. Did you did you leave some out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I left out uh, po- poems that. Um, I, I felt like, you know, I wasn't ready to put them out. Uh, yes. But most of them are like personal related to my family, like my my bigger family, you know, my mother, my father. Um, I felt like this wasn't the time um, to do that. And I prefer to put that in prose because I don't want people to... Um, yes, so I, I, I felt like this wasn't the time. So I left that out. Yeah, because um, like like when I write some 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 pieces, it's so personal, you know, that you, you feel that it's almost a violation if somebody else reads, <laughs> you, yeah. writing, you know, and yeah. I keep talking about my grandmother, my great grandmother, actually. And people say, well, you, you've been writing this book about her. And then when are you going to publish it? I'm like, no, she's my great grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's yeah. how I felt before I sent the, the book to the, to the publisher. So it, it, it almost seemed like when I sent it to her, I sent a note, you know, I'm like, I am sending you the most precious thing in my life tonight. Yes. You know, I put the date. And she read it, she was laughing. She's like, I'm not going to harm your book. I'm not going to do anything. But yeah, I think it's that way where you struggle, you know, in terms of defining what is public and what, what is, is private. And yeah, so... You can push as much as you want to. I'm someone who, you know, I, I believe that I'm a very radical person. I'm a feminist. So I'm able to do all of that analysis that says, you know, what you could have to be taboo is not, you know, actually taboo for me in terms of um, written expression. Yeah. 
and and uh, if I may just ask this, um, what is how, how is the work of the Liberia Feminist Forum? Are they actively involved in in Liberia in working with women? Could you tell us a little bit about it? So the the Liberian Feminist Forum is um, it's a we call it a safe space for Liberian feminists because the mere idea that you would self-identify as a feminist in Liberia is trouble. So it's a safe space yeah, for us, um, but it's also a place where we do a lot of you know, political analysis, technical analysis around the, the issues that affect Liberian women. Uh, we've done, we've used, you know, numerous tactics in our work. So we've had marshes, like everyone who do the, the protests, but then we also recognize that it's important to have um, uh, a national base, but also uh, be able to do um, external engagement in such a way that you're changing um, the context of Liberia and not necessarily uh, relying on the systems that actually violate people's rights. So we've been doing a lot of that. We started in 2014 um, and we were self-supporting. So we did not get resources from anybody. I think they, we got money from funding from the African Women Development Fund. We got money from the Urgent Action Fund Africa um, and we always got money just to have convenience. So it would be a max, you know, $10,000. But last year, we spent a lot of time raising, you know, doing fundraising. And now we have money to do long-term programs um, for a three-year period. So we are now developing a strategy, uh, one that is going to be aligned to the work that other women are doing on the ground. I know you're involved with the um group on sexual and gender-based violence. So we're trying to develop a strategy where we connect and we can do, um, we can deepen the work that is happening, but be more consistent. So it's not one of, you know, activities. So that's what uh, we do as the Liberian Feminist Forum. Um, yeah, we're not like a, we're more like an advocacy sort of think tank uh, kind of um, structure, if you may call it that. So with with the advocacy, do you do you um, like critique policies, like, like government policies? Do you critique things that you? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We do we do so, and we also contribute our ideas. Like for example, the um, national development strategy, the PAPD. Uh, yeah. We made inputs into that, you know, to ensure that there was a gender analysis. Um, we have done, you know, we've, we've offered a lot of um, support in terms of technical analysis to other government uh, bodies. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Gender, um, our members attend the different meetings and we talk about our experience. We have, you know, members of the Librarian Feminist Forum, we have very, I guess, um, extensive experience on access to justice. So the whole issue of why are we not solving the problem around rape in Liberia, that's something that, you know, as people who have worked on this, I've worked on that for, you know, close to 15 years. And like five years ago, more than five years ago, we came up with some solutions and went to the, you know, government uh, person in charge and said, this is what we see as the gap. Um, let's also start to focus on prevention because you don't want to get to the point where people are raped then you're finding ways to solve it. How about investing in... You know, a process so that it does not happen at all. So we started this conversation long ago. You know, to be able to contribute that is available, then you know, it's it's going to be um, a better situation. But right now, it's challenging to get into spaces and contribute as you know a, a technician, someone who has the experience doing this kind of work. So this is what you know. I work with actually. I um, you know cover close to 43 countries. So this is the kind of work I do in terms of technical advisory services. And if I can do it for other countries, I should be able to do it for my country without, you know, asking for anything, not a fee, not a cent, you know, but just to say this is the experience and let's, you know, sort of test it out and see how it works around people's human rights. 
with the with the um, with your writings, do you do you um, foresee in the future uh, returning to Liberia to perhaps um, I don't know encourage or foster this love of writing with young writers as well? Are you aligned with any kind of um, literary association within Liberia? I, I I see now that there are a few of them coming up. <laughs> Well, if you if you count our portrait reading group, you know, we used to do portrait reading um every Friday. I think it was maybe no, not every Friday, it must have been um once a month where we will come in and read and sort of encourage each other. Some people would write, some people would read, you know, poems that already exist. If you count that, yeah, that's it. Um I started an organization um, that I feel like I am going to build on. So it's called Women Rights, okay. as in women, and then rights, W-R-I-T-E-S, but again, it's a play on words. Um, so I started that, and I feel like that is going to be an important um, platform in my future in terms of the writing that I do, but also in terms of getting more people on board to tell their story because that was the reason why I, I formed this. I felt like the stories that we needed to hear to help to fix Liberia, those stories were not being put out there. They are not being put out there because in our country, we have this thing where we put people in categories. You know, this woman, um, she's sitting in Bapolu. Um, she did not go to college. So maybe she doesn't have a story. And I think when we can recognize that everyone has a story and that story can be documented in a way that they're comfortable, then it, it brings some, it sheds light on the soul of our country. Like what are people thinking? What are people feeling? You know, that's important. So I started this, um, I haven't done a lot on the women's rights. I guess it's still, you know, something that was registered and, you know, I'm trying to, I did it when I was about to leave the country. But the, Definitely, I am going to uh, return to Liberia, hopefully soon, um, and do more work, you know, around this. Um, I'm not, I don't have the skills, you know, to say that I can train people, but I definitely have the um, convening, you know, sort of um, power to say, let's get together and, and tell the stories of our country, tell the stories of women, of our pain, of our victories, that's something I think I can do. I've always felt that, you know, for July 26th, they always have an orator. And I've always said that what they need is to have a full hour of poetry reading. People come yes, up. I they, agree. they tell, yeah, it's an, it's an epic story of Liberia's history. And, you know, weave this literary landscape and the historical events. Just read your yeah. open mic, July 26th. Yes. The thing is, no one is going to feel like you're offending them because this yeah. is a, a poem, you know, like take it or leave it. You yeah. know, that's why I say it's the creatives that will, will save us. Yes, yes. We yes. are the creatives, ones yes. you've been yes. waiting That's what Marquez yeah. says. He said we will create yes. a new utopia. A new utopia yeah. we're going to do create through our writing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really, I'm sorry. I could talk forever. Just ask, ask you what's going on. Yeah, I've, done more than, I've done more than 80%. So I think. Yeah, definitely. Well. Um, I'm yes. so, so, um, so uh, tomorrow is the launch open to everybody or. Um, so I have a room virtual. where I've invited. Yeah. I've invited people. I've put the link. There's a zoom link. Um, I'll put it out again tomorrow morning for all those who are interested. Um, it's also going to be recorded on, you can watch it on Facebook Live. Um, it's going to be recorded and put on YouTube. So there are opportunities for people who may not have the time, you know, to, to do that. Um, I know in the U.S. it's going to be around, um, I need to check the time. Um, but I know in Liberia it's going to be around 3. In Nairobi it's going to be around um Six o'clock, six p.m. Yes, so um, that I will, I will have you know documentation. So for everyone who does not have the time, uh, there will be documentation that you can go back. You know when you during your free time and, and just watch it or watch the launch. 
and listen to the different uh, speakers. Um, I'll really be, you know, happy. I, there's there's so many there are so many people who have registered. Um, at some point in time, I was surprised, but then I realized that this is this book and just the topic of memory within the Liberian society and redemption is something that we all connect to. So I, I understand why people are interested and why people would like to, you know, be a part of this. Um, and yeah, so I'm open to having more conversations to, you know, investing more into the, the project inappropriate um, medley. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Uh, um, uh, it's at 10.30 tomorrow morning, uh, Eastern time, right? It's yeah. at 10.30 tomorrow morning eastern time and then it's i think it's at it's three o'clock liberian time gmt yes, yes it's gmt yes. three o'clock yes, yes. Five, five o'clock south africa if you're in south africa 6 p.m in east africa um so so you can you can you can watch the launch if you you cannot I'm, I'm sure it will be broadcast as she said on facebook so please make sure to to celebrate with Koto on this achievement. We are all really proud yes. of this. Please get a glass of wine. Yes. Whatever you drink and just, you know, make that toast to, to your memories. Yes. The things you've forgotten and the things that you want to remember about Liberia and how to fix it. Yeah. I live in, in wine country, so definitely I'm going to get some. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> And watch I look forward and, to seeing you. Yeah. Yes. And watch it, yes. <laughs> so um uh I don't know, Dennis is uh it's not it's not on, so we will I, I know you're tired, I know it's late. Um, but yeah. but uh, if anybody has questions, please ask us. We are here to answer your questions. Koto is here to answer your questions. Um I was I was I was Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I was I was going to ask you about um, about poetry because uh, I know that poetry can act as a reservoir, or you know, of things that are happening. It's like a, a reservoir, a repository, as you know, of things that are, because yeah. Yeah. because Liberetto for Liberia was an epic poem, right? Or, or, 500 lines about nothing but what's happening in Liberia. So uh, reading reading the, the different um, pieces is almost like piecing together the history, but the history of the everyday of those mm -hmm. being forgotten and the voiceless, you know? I mean, that's how mm -hmm. I, I saw it. So it's, yeah. So I, I want to thank you again for, for, for joining us. I know tomorrow is a busy time for you. So we're going to let you go yeah. get sleep. And we're going to say good luck on your launch. You know, Thank you. Liberians will be there with you in spirit, if not in person. We will be there virtually to celebrate with you. And congratulations again, Koto. And thank, thank you. you so much for joining us today. Thank yeah. you very much, uh, Jackie. I appreciate your kind words. I'm really happy the way that you are, you know, excited about the book and talking about it in an intimate way already. You know, that's what I'm hoping that everyone would, you know, experience. And thank you for inspiring me to actually write the book, even though okay. you did not do it. Directly. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And as thank Dennis you. always tells us, he and Ansoni and the Focus on Liberia, we are all one people. It's one Liberia. And this is Focus on Liberia. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We all love you. Love you, people.